Good morning and welcome to the recent Queens Municipalities Council regular meeting Tuesday, January 9th, 2024. I'd like to call the meeting to order. There are two additions to the agenda. Item 8.4, live streaming has been requested by Councillor Charlton and garbage boxes has been requested by Councillors Brown and Hawks. Are there any other additions? Councillor Muse? I'd like to put 8.6 discussions, uh, street lights. 8.6, street lights. Any further additions? If not, I'll ask for approval of the agenda moved by Councillor Brown, seconded by Councillor Charlton. All those in favor? Thank you. This morning we have two guests with us who will introduce themselves. They're here to talk about the Pensick Conservation Mosaic. And Melissa and Gabrielle, I'll turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. And Lilia uh, Tipu, good morning, everybody. My name is Melissa Labrador. I'm from the Wildcat community here in Guestwick, and I'm the Indigenous lead to the conservation mosaic that the uh, mayor had mentioned, known as PEMSIC. It's going to take some getting used to, I think. Good morning. My name is Gabrielle Beaulieu. I work with Parks Canada. Um, you may have known me previously as the Green Crab Project Manager, which I am no longer. Currently, I'm holding a national position with the Marine Establishment Group and collaborating with Melissa on this excellent project. So for the next eight minutes, I'm going to share a video with you that will give a little bit of an overview of the PEMSIC Conservation Mosaic Project. Um, and hopefully this will go without too much issue here. Delvisi, Doak, ABV, Aji Ukwadam, Nabok Chue. We are part of Mi'kma'ki and located within the Guestwick District. It is here you'll find Bemsek, known locally as Port Jolly, and the heart of the Bemsek Conservation Mosaic Vision. The Bemsek Mosaic Vision is within the Southwest Nova Scotia UNESCO Biosphere Reserve as well as within one of Canada's priority areas for biodiversity conservation. The early Mi'kmaq, my ancestors, navigated these lands by foot and these waters by canoe that connected the interior of Guestwick to his coastal areas. Current archaeological evidence indicates that Bemsic is a heritage landscape of unique importance which has a history span in 13,000 years. The earliest archaeological evidence from the region comes from the Sago River estuary, where a projectile point was recently recovered and dates approximately 13,000 years.
what is understood today and shared as traditional ecological knowledge is because it was everyday life for my ancestors. Through generations of observation, they knew their place and their role on this earth. Their traditions, culture, and spirituality was based on the incredible respect that they had for Mother Earth and all her creations. They knew that their actions, no matter how small, would have lasting effects on their future generations. in a respectful way so that we would be here today. Our traditional ecological knowledge was passed down through generations by waves of oral traditions that knowledge was infused in ceremonies, songs, stories, and legends. ancestors lived here. Their footsteps came and went with the tide. If you listen on the breeze, you can hear their whispers. If you close your eyes, you can feel and see their memories. This land is important. These waters are important. This landscape is a storybook waiting to be sailed. Let's honor the sacred place. The indigenous-led vision for BEMSIC is of a coordinated and collaborative conservation area that brings together existing initiatives and works to fill gaps in terrestrial and marine protection. Indigenous leadership and protection of archaeological sites is foundational to Pemsek. Bemzik is a vitally important archaeological landscape where my ancestors made their lives and created their history, my history, for 13,000 years. The landscape of the Bemzik area has changed through time, but it still remains sacred to my people. A mosaic vision of conservation for these lands and waters reflects traditional ecological knowledge by recognizing that there are many layers to an ecosystem that include terrestrial and marine. My ancestors see no boundary between terrestrial and marine spaces. They understood that what happened to one affected the other. Filling conservation gaps and supporting Indigenous perspectives of ecosystem connectivity can help achieve commitments to biodiversity protection, protected areas, and reconciliation. The Bemzik Mosaic vision of conservation works because it includes everyone. Most importantly, it includes Mother Earth 
in her creations. And it recognizes that our future generations depend on what we do today. So I'm going to just stop there, just some singing after this, but I just wanted to give you a little idea of the scope of the project that I've been working on for the last number of years. Um, I'm working in collaboration with uh, Bear River First Nation, and uh, that would be Chief Carol D. Potter, and also we'll be including um, the Annapolis Valley First Nation, Goose Gap First Nation, and Acadia First Nation as well. Um, but we're just kind of getting started on the, the work uh, more formally in a uh, pre-feasibility feasibility stage. Um, and I know there's uh, many things that I would love to chat and talk about, but um, this is kind of the, the bones of the project. Um, Pemzik, if those of you who are familiar with Fort Jolly area, is uh, so very important on an archaeological uh, and a cultural level. Um, coastal erosion is threatening those sites. Um, so it, it's not something that we can necessarily prevent, but we can learn from what we can now. Um, when I talk about conservation, conservation to me doesn't mean stopping what we have there. Uh, we have a very um, healthy fishery. We have many things that go on in the Pemzik area. Uh, many ideas and thoughts about what could continue in the Pemzik area. Uh, we have, you know, multi-generation of uh, Mi'kmaq people in the Pemzik area, um, but also those multi-generation of non-Indigenous people that are fishermen, um, that are forestry workers, so on and so forth. So considering that, you know, it's the reason why I see Pemzik being a success, because we're not... The, the goal is not to prevent fishery or, or anything like that. Um, it's to prevent the industries that would really destroy our natural resources, uh, offshore um, things, uh, you know, many different things like that. Uh, but this is a, a collaboration of many, many organizations and, and people that have um, an interest in the Pemzig area. So the map that was briefly on there, I, I don't have a map to show you yet that'll be kind of officially um, launched uh, in the next few weeks. Um, but it is already a mosaic taking place in the Pemzik area. We have provincial parks, we have nature reserves, we have uh, nature trust lands, we have uh, federal park, um, so many different colors of different layers of conservation there or protection, uh, CWS lands as well. I showed Port Martoon Island on the video because I think that's an important uh, space for for my people, but for everybody. And to be able to acquire that island for the community uh, would be a big success in, in my eyes. So that's one of my things that I'm working on now is to um, purchase that island uh, in collaboration with some other folks and uh, have it a space for our community to use. I'm going to turn things over to Gabrielle, um, as Parks Canada is one of the uh, one of the partners or one of the collaborators in this mosaic because of the Kitty Seaside Park there. Thanks, Melissa. I won't take up too much more time, um, but I do want to acknowledge like this is a collaborative project, and Bear River, through Melissa's work, approached Parks Canada. Um, asking whether we not, we would be interested in, in being involved. And so our interest is really with the marine space. Um, Government of Canada, as many of you probably know, there's commitments made through the Kunming Montreal uh, Biodiversity Convention for protecting 30% of lands and waters by 2030. So this project in particular would fit into that if we're successful. As Melissa mentioned, we're very early days um, I'm looking to initiate conversations with each and every one of you that are interested in learning more. Um, but what I can tell you is there's a five-step marine establishment process that we're just initiating for PEMSIC. 
one of the major um, pieces that we're working on right now is getting some indication from the province that they're interested in collaborating on this because there potentially would be a transfer of lands uh, required for establishing a national marine conservation area on the edges of Kejimikujik Seaside. Um, we're really happy to be speaking with you today. We know that the Queen's Coast recent branding probably aligns quite well with, um, with the establishment of, of much of this mosaic that Melissa mentioned. And so it's early days. Uh, part of this five-step process, we have to, sure. Um, part of this five-step process, you'll see here on your screen, um, you can find it online on Parks Canada's website under the National Marine Conservation Area um, Act. That act was put in place in 2002, so it's fairly recent. Across Canada, there are only five NMCAs in existence. We've committed to establishing 10 more between now and 2030, so there's a lot of work ahead of us. And this is across the country, including the Great Lakes. This is what sets us apart from uh, fisheries and oceans. One of the components of this work that Parks Canada brings to the table is we very much um, emphasize and highlight the need of ensuring this work benefits communities and Indigenous people. Then it protects ecosystems, ways of life, um, etc. The way that Parks Canada does this, does this is by ensuring that activities that take place within National Marine Conservation Areas are sustainable. So things like lobster fishery can continue. Things like herring fishery can continue. Um, all three federal government departments that look to establish protected areas now fall under the federal protection standards. So that would, as Melissa mentioned, that would prevent industrial scale activities such as oil and gas exploration. Bottom trawling is one of those highly impactful activities that it would impact. Um, dumping and deep sea mining. So this slide here really details those five steps on the left. Um, I'm sure you have an information package in front of you, I suspect. And then the components on the right are the milestones that we try to reach in order to move through the establishment process. I'm happy to take any questions or to follow up with you for a more in-depth conversation if anyone is interested. Um, but BEMSIC is a collaborative effort and the NMCA is just one component. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Gabrielle and Melissa. And I would be remiss if I did not tell council and our guests that um, we have a member of QCCR here, Rick Conrad, he just gave a wave and he will be um, doing an audio recording as, as per our policy. So questions for Gabrielle and Melissa, and thank you, uh, Councillor Brown. Thanks for the presentation, that's quite interesting. I'm wondering how uh, the upcoming aquaculture review um, in Liverpool Harbour would affect any of this going forward. Um, is, is that a, an issue? <laughs> That's a great question. So currently our study area does not include Liverpool Harbour, but in the case that we would advance through the establishment process for FEMSIC, we could certainly look to be advocates in whichever direction that the, the communities and the municipality feel is, is, is right. I just want to add, um, yes, the study area does include uh, Liverpool Harbour, um, but in the coming weeks when the actual map is released, you'll, you'll notice that it, for the uh, feasibility study, it would go about 100 kilometers offshore from PEMSIC, so Port Jolly out 100 kilometers. Um, and in the coming weeks, there'll be a number of events that we'll be holding, because there's quite a, a story with the project that involves grandmother. And grandmother is everybody's grandmother, whether it's your grandmother, my grandmother, or everybody's grandmother, and that's the connecting piece for the project. Thank you very much. Councillor Muse. Um, so it's like, I think you answered my question. Are you going to be having meetings with the fishermen to discuss this situation? Yes, absolutely. And we have met a little bit now um, previously, but we'll do some more formal meetings and things like that. And community as well. Other questions?
see you. Jodri, you have any remarks you'd like to make? As one that's been following this project, I'm glad to see you here. And I know you have a huge support network behind you. And I wish you well. And if, um, if we do feel that you could help with our case against aquaculture, we will certainly reach out. However, you're not doing a side, you're not doing a, um, a buffer zone. For example, you have your area, but you haven't considered like a, a buffer zone. It's been considered, I'll say that, because the, the question has come up before. So um, I would be happy to follow up and, and look at uh, what may, uh, you know, help the concerns of those in that area. Um, because it's, you know, the water doesn't stop at the boundary that may or may not be established. So I thank you. And, oh, one more question from Councillor Muse. Um, so this area... For the hunters, like the goose hunters and the duck hunters, are they going to be affected at all? In the area, um, there's like the CWS lands, like the Canadian Wildlife Service lands. So those lands are still there. Um, basically, those are already part of a mosaic that's existed. So um, the public lands that are beyond the highway as you go to Port Jolly, um, we haven't even looked at what they would be established at. So maybe there'll be um, community forestry. Maybe there'll be, um, you know, uh, the Tidney Wilderness area may expand a little bit. I see many different layers of different things that could be done there. Some, you know, educational component where we'd be doing, you know, things with universities, community college stu students and stuff at schools to learn about uh, traditional knowledge, but learn about other practices that apply to everybody uh, and on an environmental level. Um, so no, I, it, again, it's not about preventing things, it's about keeping healthy what we have now so that, you know, big development doesn't come in and destroy things and then we have no more goose or have no more things to hunt and enjoy and provide for our families. So it really, uh, in the feasibility stage, in the stage route we're at, is talking to the community and seeing what the community wants and what makes the most sense. Seeing no other questions, I thank you and we'll speak again. Thank you. Approval of the minutes regular, oh, public question, table and call petition. Are there any petitions to table at this point in time. 5.0 public question comment session. Please address the mic, provide your name, civic address, and you have five minutes. Good morning, Council. My name is Melissa Teeley Snail of 97 Brooklyn Shore Road. I'm approaching to you today regarding policy 23, community area rate acting the capacity sorry, of Treasurer for Brooklyn Recreation Committee and Director for Brooklyn Cemetery Committee. I have over 20 years of experience in accounting and finance, across public accounting, private companies such as Crayola, and publicly traded companies such as Canopy Growth, where I currently sit as Director of Cost Accounting. I've reviewed the proposed changes and draft policy, oh, sorry, and wish to comment on some of the sections within the draft. Um, sections 13 through 18, which outline Public consultation and vote. These sections do not address the frequency in which public consultation process should occur. It was my understanding that a clause would be added indicating that these activities should occur at a minimum, at a minimum of 10 years. These sections do not address which action or actions are required to trigger a public consultation to occur other than direction of council. Page 55 indicates that sections 22 and 26 should have a submission date changed from January 15th to February 15th, but it's not reflected on page 60 of the draft in the new revision of policy. Having this date extended would ensure that applicants with the December 31st year end have an opportunity to hold an EGM in which eligible ratepayers have an opportunity to attend, be heard, and vote on funding and allocation of funds within their tax district. Um, and then table A, financial reporting requirements. 
The time taken to establish the tiers for funding is greatly appreciated due to the cost of a basic review, i.e. notice to reader performed by a CPA firm, can be a substantial percentage of the funds requested by the requester like Brooklyn Recreation Committee, Brooklyn Cemetery Committee, who requests roughly about 32 and 32,000 and 12,000 respectively. Given the organizations are to request a rate per $100 capped assessed and not a fixed rate when applying for renewal, how does an organization able to determine the tier they fall in given the high increases in assessments that have been rolled out over the past couple of years? I understand that the only difference between tier two and tier three is a requirement for a nose to reader, but areas within the policy indicate that missing areas are required within seven days of receiving a request for additional information. And that is not a sufficient timeline for an organization to make motions to appoint a CPA firm to perform the review, approach a CPA firm to engage in the review and have a signed report returned to the organization. I would hope that this instance um, would provide for forgiveness of timing and renewal of applications would not be discarded. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Yes. <coughs> the mic's still on, I guess, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Norman, Leon Robertson, College Street in Liverpool, under 7.3. The Queen's Place, the concessions there. I'm glad to see the recommendation coming forward to have the Qantas Club uh, operate that for the next uh, for the next year or so. And uh, being a member of the club, it'll certainly help both you people out, I guess, and it should help our club out. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address council? Seeing none. I'll seek approval of the minutes regular council December 12th, 2023, moved by Councillor Charlton, seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Approved. 6.2, approval of special council December 7th, 2023, moved by Councillor Hawk, seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Approved. 6.3, approval of special council December 19th, 2023, moved by Councillor Gidney, seconded by Councillor Romero. All those in favor? Approved. Just takes us forward to recommendations. 7.1, road naming Lingley Lane. This was before us as discussion at our last meeting. It's now back as a recommendation. There is a recommendation in the package, if, if a councillor would so make that recommendation. Councillor Charlton. I move that the Council of Region of Queen's Municipality approve the naming of a new road off Cobbs Ridge Road in Liverpool as Lingley Lane. And that is seconded by Councillor Brown. Director McLeod, brief summary, please. Uh, yes, Mayor Norman. Um, just to, uh, quickly that this uh, uh, proposed road naming of Lingley Lane, um, it is acceptable um, to the municipality as no similar or uh, same name exists within the current uh, road listing. Um, so the owner is the applicant in this case and the uh, uh, application is in conformance with uh, the region's naming and renaming of roads policy. Are there any questions of Director McLeod? Hearing none, I'll ask for the question. All those in favor? Approved unanimously. 7.2 road naming. There is, once again, this was also before its last council meeting, and there is a recommendation within our package. Councillor Brown? I recommend that the Council of the Region of Queen's Municipality approve the naming of a new road off Willow Lane in Somerville Centre as Audra Lynn Lane. And that is seconded by Councillor Muse. Again, Director McLeod. Uh, yes, Mayor Norman. Uh, the first name choice of the uh, uh, petition of Audrey Lynn Lane is acceptable to the planning department as, as no similar or same road name exists. Uh, 
again, uh, the applicant is the owner of the of the road, so uh, the request is in conformance with the the region's policy for renaming and renaming of roads. Any questions of Director McLeod? Seeing none, I'm going to ask for the question. All those in favor? Contrary? Approved. 7.3, Queen's Place and Marist Center concessions operation. This had been before us and staff were directed to come back with the recommendation. There is a recommendation within the package if a counselor would so make that recommendation. Councillor Brown. Sorry. I recommend that the Council of the Region of Queen's Municipality enter a one-year agreement with the Kiwanis Club of Liverpool for operation of concessions at Queen's Place Amara Centre at such time that all terms and conditions outlined in the facility agreement are met and that the agreement satisfies a legal review. And that is seconded by Councillor Hawks. <coughs> Mr. Burns, Manager of Events, Promotions, and Sponsorship. Uh, just a brief follow up from the last uh, report uh, in mid December. Um, we again consulted the uh, Department of Environment and Climate Change, and uh, it was agreed that. Yes, a one-year uh, term is the uh, best course of action in this instance. And we now just have a few uh, few questions to be answered by uh, um, Mr. Schofield and the Qantas Club, and then um, we would proceed to uh, have the agreement vetted and move forward. CAO Jodry. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to mention, so typically what we would do is we'd bring a draft of the lease in front of you for, for council to sign off. Unfortunately, timing prevented us from doing that this time, so that's why it's not in your package. Normally, that would be our practice, um, but uh, but through vacations and typically would have those lease agreements drafted by lawyers. Um, that couldn't quite happen, so basically what we've done instead, assuming council wanted to move quickly, was sort of get council's authorization to sign a lease in principle based on the items that we have in here. Not that you have to do that. You can wait for us to bring back a, a lease agreement next time, or which we could do. Um, but I just want to explain why there's no draft lease in here for you to see. So hearing that, the question to council would be, are you confident approving a lease you have not seen, or would you prefer to see it in a draft form once it's been vetted by our legal team. Councillor sure. Gidney. I, I, I personally would like to see a draft form. Uh, I have problems approving things or recommending things that I don't have all the information. So I, I understand there's been a lot of work done on this and I do appreciate all the work that's being done. But for my for myself, I need to, I, I would, re, re, would request the additional information. Other opinions, please. Councillor Merrill. Um, I agree with Councillor Gidney. I, I would like to see it before I approve it. Um, thank you. If if there are other councillors who are of this opinion, then we need a motion to table. I just have a question before we go there. Um, we don't currently have a food permit that we're holding, like in our name. For We do. Okay. So my question is, um, once this is sorted out, um, the Kiwanis has to operate under their own food, own food permit. Is that correct? Yes. And how long does it take approximately to get a food permit in this case? You're not turned on. It should take them approximately a couple of weeks, within a couple of weeks of that, that they should be able to get a permit from the department. May I continue? Um, I too would appreciate seeing the lease firsthand and I guess that was kind of my question is, is this potentially going to slow anything down but the food permit is several weeks out um, so I would be most comfortable with uh, council receiving a copy of that so we can get that going. 
And as I said, we need a motion to table if that is what the majority of council wishes. Councillor Romero? I have another question. Um, if we hold a fur food permit, is there a reason that these organizations can't work under our food permit? Well, that, that would be a question of um, whether, I guess, the Region of Queens is willing to accept the um, insurance responsibility of having folks operate the fryers, ovens, and those types of things. As well, any, uh, any violations that could take place upon an inspection would reflect on the Region of Queens, and we potentially lose our food establishment permit. Councillor Brown. I see the uh, there's there's some information about the uh, championship host society. Will this cause any problems with with that group uh, running the canteen or, or providing concession services during that event, or is, or will they be able to work together on that? Uh, as as was indicated, I guess in the first uh, in 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 the base of the report was that there are clauses within the agreement that you know would allow. Uh, other entities to enter to uh, in 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 segments of time within the agreement. Um, should it be beneficial to other organizations doing the canteen for their events, and Qantas agreed to step aside if necessary. And Mr. Burns, I believed it was actually part of their bid that there would be canteen services available. So therefore, with the Kiwanis having the operation of the canteen, it does assure that they're able to to do what they said they would do um, for the curling. And as we know, groups work hand in hand. Hank Snow Center, that's a valuable um, fundraiser for them should they use the Amir Center again for the tribute. And it, we would be hopeful that the Kiwanis and the Hank Snow Center would come to some joint arrangements respecting the, the profits from that canteen during the Hank Snow tribute, correct? Correct. So are we going to move forward on the motion or is the motion going to be tabled? Because the motion is on the floor and I can call for question at any time. I'd like to table the motion to the next meeting or to until we have an agreement in place. And seconder to table, Councillor Romero. All those in favor of tabling? Passed. Council implementation report is in front of you. Are there any questions respecting our progress on past motions. Hearing none, eight point Councillor Romero. Um, under the November 14th to, to direct the pool committee um, for the next steps, I'm just wondering when we could expect this report to come back to council. Uh, next council is our anticipated time, but we're can't guarantee that just yet. It might be the first one in February, but one of those two. Community area rate policy discussion 8.2. Director Vino, Director of Corporate Services. We've heard from um, a public speaker respecting this policy and we are aware that this policy is not relevant to one particular organization. This would be a policy that would be relevant to all organizations despite if they're requesting $10,000 or $300,000 off of area rates. So it's very important that we keep in mind that this is not a one organization policy and I do notice that we have new numbers a new table in front of us um, that you've submitted so if perhaps you could walk us through thanks 
So as you, <clears throat> sorry, as you all know, um, the last council meeting that I attended in November, there was considerable discussion regarding the revision of the area rate policy. Council asked for clarity on reporting requirement options, practice in other municipal units, and allowable use of application of area rates and some additional wording and revisions to the policy. So I went through and I changed some of the things and I highlighted these things in the staff report, the things that I had changed. One of the things that was a concern was the financial reporting requirement. So I added a table at the back of the policy and I did put um, a supplementary paper on all of your um, desks this morning. And I, I put the table together based on two year ends, December 31st, and there's also a March 31st one in the table because those are typically one or the other year ends, but an organization could choose any year end they wish. It doesn't have to be December 31st and it doesn't have to be March 31st. So I guess we can't, um, my concern is that we can't really have the table designed for one specific year end because organizations can pick whatever year end they want. So I tried to choose dates um, that would fit as best I could in terms of the reporting requirements. I also noted that there was a comment from um, a member of the public, I believe it was Melissa who spoke this morning, regarding um, the requirement to change a date in the year in the actual policy for renewal, which I did. That was correct. She was absolutely correct. So section 22, I changed it to community organizations with an existing area rate shall submit annually to Director of Corporate Services by February 15th. It was previously January 15th. Sorry, I just want to explain. So, so um, the director put a revised copy of that, um, which would be different than the one in your package on your desk today with that correction that she's speaking about. Yes, my apologies. Um, the other thing that I changed was that if uh, the community, or actually I wanted to just make a note that if you're doing, um, if it's your year of renewal, which is the second year of any council's mandate, which is section 25. We discussed that. That was one of the recommendations that you had asked staff to make. If that is the case, that the documents still have to be submitted on January 15th, even though it's a renewal because staff have to organize public consultation and everything, so we can't do that if the documents don't come in on February 15th. So I'm, I'm going to go back to my staff report because I found out a lot of interesting things that I think council um, would be interested in, hence the expression. So the practice in other municipal units, I know Council Charlton specifically asked me about that, and we're one of the few that does this. Um, most municipalities don't. They have uh, community rates for specific assets that are owned by the municipality, not by community groups. Um, and the HRM is the biggest one who does that, and I've linked their policy in here. So I'll give you an example. So um, a neighborhood of Community A would like to have um, a playground. So they apply for a community rate to pay for and maintain the playground, which they may be granted by the council. But at the end of the day, the playground that they're maintaining and they get is not the property of the community organization is the property of the municipality and that's the difference with what we're doing here is that the assets that we're talking about aren't municipally owned so there's that um, that criteria the other thing I discovered is that our policy is written such that the entire um, tax district is under the area or community rate that doesn't necessarily have to be the case we have the capability to choose a smaller or different um, definition of a catchment area. For example, fire rates. So in modal, for example, there are charges on my tax bill that are specific to my fire department. And it says United Communities, I don't know, two cents or whatever it is, fire department. That's called a fire rate. And that's specific to the catchment area of those fire department. It has nothing to do with what tax district those properties or assessment numbers are located in. I did not know that. As you all know, I'm relatively new to municipal government, so that was something that I learned. 
And I will thank Councillor Brown because he was the one that pointed that out to me. Um, so the reporting standards for these various um, types of rates range from review by staff only to audited statements for fire departments with the unit um, with the unit with specific policy requiring a new application each year and charging a fee to the organizations to administer the billing. So um, that was the County of Kings and they require renewal every single year and they charge a fee. And again, HRM has policies, key components are purpose for the rate, duration of time the rate, amount of the rate, uniform charge or assessment base, catchment area and a financial plan. I also had an extensive conversation with our municipal advisor about this because I understand when this came up um, last year, there was conversations between our municipal advisor and the mayor and our municipal clerk at the time. And I won't go into all of it, but the most important thing she said is that there are two priorities that council should consider when choosing an area or community rate. Public engagement is number one. You must have the buy-in of everybody who's going to be charged that rate or at least the majority and two accountability for the money it's taxpayers money and it's important that there's account proper accountability standards included in the policy um, and to mayor norman's point this policy is written for all rates not one so when i went back to the table i put in brackets that i thought were doable reasonable. I also put in um, estimated costs at the end and this is the this is the um, supplementary paper that I put on all of your desks. So under the reporting requirements year one is our in counting years we do like 2020 X. That's how we do it because year changes every year. So 2020 X and 2020 X minus one and then you see over here. So requirements for 24 25 tax year I kind of put the 2020 axes into the actual year so you can see um, I can go over them all but um, I think they're pretty straightforward I tried to use um, basic language and tried to make it as straightforward as it is even though it tends to get a little convoluted so if council wants to um, discuss I'm sorry I tried to follow what, what concerns were raised but I'm sorry she spoke really quickly I didn't catch everything it's okay. Um, uh, anyway, does it? Is there any question? Any questions to Director Vino? As you can see in front of you, um, if if an organization is asking for under five thousand dollars collected, it would be uh, estimated zero cost for financial reporting. If they're five thousand to fifty thousand dollars coming off of taxpayers. Again, it would be zero cost of financial reporting. Any organization asking for $50,000 to $100,000 um, of taxpayer money for their purpose, um, a notice to read or financial statement is estimated to cost approximately $1,500, plus some other things such as preliminary finances and budgets using forms that we provide. And if any organization is asking for over $100,001, then there is audited financial statements and audits, as you can see, can be very expensive. However, as council, we are responsible for taxpayers' money. And a group asking for over $100,000 from their neighbors and their community um, it is viewed that that is a substantial ask and audited statements should be made available when that much money is being provided to community groups coming straight off of um, area rates. So questions to Director Vino. Can I add something just before I answer the questions? Um, CAO Georgia, when we were um, reviewing this report, he asked me to put in the cost for review. And that's a different level of assurance. So right now there's three levels. There's notice to reader, review, and audit. The big difference between review and audit is that there's actual transactional testing done in audit. They ask for samples. They ask for checks. They ask for invoices. They vouch the payments back to the source. Review is just more of um, questioning. They don't go into depth with 
the testing in a review. It is more of um, looking over the re doing reasonability tests based on certain st certain um, statistical formulas for number of transactions, etc. That's why the cost is so much less. Um, even if we do an audit, it is not 100% guarantee that any fraud will be found or mistakes. It happens. So I guess I don't want counsel to think that if we require an audit, it's going to mean that every audit is going to detect any kind of misappropriation of funds because it certainly does not. Question to Director Vino. Just, just one thing. I think um, Melissa had brought up the one thing that maybe I don't think you touched on yet was uh, there were two things. One is the reporting period, the difference between what the reporting period is and when the information would be due. So I think there was some discussion about that. And then, uh, sorry, there was one more thing. Maybe we could just... Um, excuse me, we're having side conversations and no one's mics turned on. Um, this is discussion only and it's not going forward to, you know, it's not a motion, it's discussion only. So as chair, I'm going to disallow the side conversation between the gallery and the speaker. And um, because that can be dealt with where it should be and not between guests and staff. Councillor Romero. So, Joanne, could you explain Section 26, please? So, in the revised copy that Council received, Section 26 says, if community organizations with an existing rate do not submit the required documents by January 15th in the year of public consultation, the area rate will not be renewed for the next fiscal year. And the reason I added that is because existing in at section 25, existing area rate shall be subject to public consultation and a full day vote at the expense of the community organization holding the area rate in the second year of the council's mandate unless the rate was initially approved in the prior year. So what that means is if the area rate has to be revisited, then staff need the documentations by January 15th because we have to organize those community meetings and the community votes. So that's why section 26 still says January 15th and I added in the year of public consultation just to clarify that. Are there other questions? Councillor Brown? Yeah, we've had a lot of discussion about uh, the rates for uh, road groups like the uh, lot owners associations, would this be able to, to take place of, of that, to be able to, <clears throat> for them to move forward as a, as an area rate request with, with a separate catchment area just for their members? It's my understanding that the road levy is a bylaw issue, and this is a community versus area rate issue. I'm not sure of the nuances of them. I'm sure that our CAO could respond to that better. Um, to to answer the question, yes, this could apply to the road levies, or we could proceed with the road levy approach we have set out. Either would work. I think the reason the road levy, and yes, it is a bylaw, but the, the, the reason, I mean, ultimately it's still practice. Um, the reason that we, I think that approach was being pursued was with the idea that we couldn't do an area rate that applied to an area that we sort of drew on a map, if you will. Uh, but as Director Vino explained, we can in fact draw a map and say anything, any property that falls within this area can have a certain uh, um, area rate applied to it. 
where I think this gets interesting versus the road levy. And just to clarify, is what's an area rate is a essentially a percentage of your assessed value, right? So different people's houses, when they're valued different, will pay different amounts. With the road levy, what you're doing is you're essentially saying there's a flat rate. So that that's why you would take that approach. So you could council could go with either, but just to clarify, you could use an area rate for the road levy, or you could just do it the way um, it's being discussed. But either is fine. Yeah. Just just to follow up, I think uh, Councillor Vina or the I'm doing it now, Director Vino <laughs> uh, said in her her original uh, speech that when she checked what other municipalities were doing. Some of them actually do do a flat rate or a cents on the tax dollar that there is the option to go that way. So, you know, go, going this route on an area rate for some of these uh, road levies might take more of the strain off of the municipality and the groups by not having to go through the bylaw route. I think it would, uh, you know, setting up a new bylaw is, is cumbersome for something that we can do as an area rate maybe. Uh, I'm open to looking at that. Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Brown, and the the area rate or bylaw for road levies for the private roads groups wanting them. They really both have the same outcome. If a person refuses to pay their road levy on their private roads, then their land can become tax saleable. If a person refuses to pay an area rate, which is placed on a tax bill, can we then is that also Private taxable. So, um, before I address Councillor Romero, who's already spoken, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Councillor Romero. Um, uh, having gone through this and um, studied this in depth, I'd just like to thank Joanne. She did an amazing job on this. Um, I think the structure, as far as the financial reporting requirements, um, I'm very happy with that. Um, I will. Um, speak about Melissa mentioned about the public consultation and vote minimum of 10 years but if you go back in section 25 it does already say that um, there will be holding an area rate in the second year of council's mandate so that is going to happen so um, there's no problem with that whatsoever um, and the income and expenditures and the balance sheet. I think that will give Joanne a lot of information. Um, and I feel very, um, very good about this um, area right now that it, she's made all the um, recommendations. She's brought them all forward in this new revised one. So um, I'm very pleased with it. The only thing is um, right now, if we, if we go ahead with this and, and council is okay with with this new revised area rate um, Brooklyn Recreation has already submitted um, their papers to Bella Rovino um, and the amount is for the notice to reader is fifteen hundred dollars plus so um, I'm just looking to see if council would think about rebating Brooklyn Recreation for that amount, Brooklyn Cemetery, um, I guess they haven't um, started their notice to reader yet. Um, maybe we could omit them from doing that. They only have about 10 invoices, maybe 10 checks. Um, so I'm just uh, just wondering about that area. Councillor Romero, thank you for your concern for the groups. Um, I think that's a topic for our next meeting. At this point in time, we're dealing with with this matter, and that isn't that's a separate matter. So not to confuse the matters, um, we want to stick to the policy twenty three community area rate, and we're what we're looking for is if council are satisfied with this, then we need a motion to move this forward for a formal recommendation at our next meeting. And Councillor Mero, that concern you have needs to come back at, a, at a, another meeting for for council consideration. So may I ask a question, Mayor Norman? Um, because, because this policy has not been adopted by council, the current policy stands 
and the deadline for reporting is January 15th, which, as you know, is knocking on the door. So what would be Council's direction um, for applicants for this coming tax year? Do they have to have everything into me by January 15th, which is, what, four days from now? That's a question to Council. Councilor Charlton? Um, I, too, am happy with um, what's been done here. Thank you, Joanne. I think this is a fair and equitable way to not burden these smaller um, organizations, but also to provide good accountability to our taxpayers. Um, so I'm satisfied with that. Um, I have no problem making a motion to move this forward. And I guess to that comment, I think that it would be reasonable to these organizations to have their information in for the middle of February if the consensus of council is uh, is to accept this and and foresee a recommendation back the next time. Is there a seconder to move this forward to our next council meeting and extend the date for paperwork to February 15th? I believe Councillor Charlton, that's what you said. Uh, seconded by Councillor Gidney. Um, all in favor? So we'll see this back at our next meeting. Thank you. Twenty twenty four marks the um, year of municipal elections and what is on everyone's mind is paper, electronic, whatever the decision is, um, it needs to be made and CAO Jodry did some research on this so we're going to turn the discussion over to him. Thank you. Um, I, I think the report stands for itself but I do have an update. Um, uh, but I should know more by the end of the week. There, the, in here, I said that there was a group of municipalities who were proceeding with electronic voting um, for the upcoming election, and that our opportunity to join that group has passed. It turns out that may, in fact, not be the case. I'll know more by the end of the week. So if council is interested in entertaining the discussion of electronic voting for 2024, then I would still... Um, suggest that they then ask for a more detailed report at the next council meeting and then I would be able to have a more substantial update at that point but if council doesn't want to entertain electronic voting then don't ask for that report essentially <laughs> electronic voting versus paper voting and there have been some units that have done both during the same election so there's actually three options, electronic only, paper only, electronic and paper. So what do you wish to see staff come back with for uh, to do their research on? Councillor Romero. i like to see electronic and paper. Um, when I um, was first um, approached and I guess when I was out um, running around, um, I was asked a lot about electronic voting. I think it's the way of the future, but we do have a lot of elderly here as well um, that still do not have anything to do with computers. So I think both, that would give us kind of both of, of, bef both of best, best of both worlds. Um, because I think you're going to get a lot of people um, voting electronically now. Uh, there's a lot done on computers, so so I think we should go with both. Uh, so Councillor Romero said investigated too. So do we want to see all three? Do you want to see a paper only, an electronic only, or a paper and because if we ask for just one, and it comes back at a huge cost, then we're going to send staff back again. So, Councillor Charlton. Thank you. Um, I think it's very important that we proceed um, and initiate electronic voting. 
Uh, there were a lot of municipalities uh, in 2020 who, of course, jumped in on that because of the pandemic, but are continuing with that. Um, earlier last year, um, elections, elections in Nova Scotia, voters in Preston casted the first e-ballots. Um, the province of Nova Scotia amended their uh, legislation to allow for that, which I presume will be um, the future for their 2025 election as well. However, um, what I noticed in reading about that is that uh, the electronic voting was only used for early voting prior to election day and traditional paper ballots were used on election day. Um, in looking at uh, HRM, HRM has been doing electronic voting for quite some time. Uh, there's a information package online that's available I can share with members of council, but uh, same thing, electronic voting uh, was done ahead of time uh, with advanced polls. They also uh, do telephone voting and again the uh, voting on elections day was only paper so uh, seems to be like a common approach there as far as my view would be I'm not interested in only seeing a paper option we're doing that now and I don't think that that is providing enough um, options for people with barriers to vote when I was campaigning in 2020 I came across a um, a woman with severe mobility issues who wanted to vote um, and, and did not, she did not leave her house. I explained the voting by proxy, but people are not um, accepting of that. Some people don't want other people to know how they're going to vote. They don't want to share any information or even ask someone to assist them. So I think it's important for us to move forward with this. Um, I guess just options in general, but um, I just want to make sure that I guess we're clear um, as a, from a council perspective, if the majority of people are supporting this, that we can move forward quickly with this, because to me, it does sound like there's a time crunch um, either way. So I guess um, in my mind, I would like to see the electronic voting happen, but um, also traditional voting um, on election day. And I know there have been um, some comments made about maybe that's still a digital platform, but people can actually go to their polling district and have assistance with a staff member in doing that um, if they can't. But uh, those would be my preferences, either that or the traditional voting on election day with um, electronic voting advanced. Thank you, Councillor Charlton. Other opinions? Deputy Mayor Fancy. Yes, I think what everybody had said here is, is all valid points. I think. Uh, like Councillor Miro said about uh, having uh, uh, both, I think it's. I think we're the last. I know even the last election, we we decided just to stay with the paper. And we're we don't want to be falling behind. We we went to we get to get into electronic age. Uh, as far as uh, where do you draw the line between uh, where you can vote electronically and where you can do paper? Should you cut it off the same day? I think this the. I think that electronic voting should be all the way through, and and uh, paper. Again, uh, I know I had one person talk about uh, doing proxy, and proxy can be so complicated. Try to get papers over to people, and get them to sign, and then get somebody to bring it in and things. So, uh, I think that's uh, that usually doesn't work very well. Uh, so, uh, even on the day of election. Uh, we have people. We have a. We have more and more people with mobility issues. That you find it very hard to get out to vote, and there's going to be more and more people, especially older people. They don't like to vote in advance. They want to vote the day of election. So if we cut the electronics off on the day of, of election and just have paper, it will be. They will miss the opportunity. So I think electronics should be all the way through, and uh, and along with paper, uh, because uh, again. We have a lot of older people, and we uh, we need people to be able to have all both options. So electronic and paper, all the, the staff will have to investigate to see if it's actually possible to run electronic paper on the same day. Um, that units don't makes me question if it is a possibility, but that would be a staff investigation to determine. Councillor Brown. Yeah, I think it's uh, 
a great option. A, a lot of people, especially the you know the traditional people who really get involved in politics, they they still talk about going out and putting their X on a paper ballot. You know, so there's there's a lot of people who still want to see a paper ballot, but with our widespread rural areas, it's hard for some people to get out to the polling stations. You know, they're they're hard to get to. So I think having the electronic option will will get more people involved, especially. You know, if we look at uh, an election day that, that rains, polling numbers go way down, which would be, you know, ter it, it, it's a terrible thing that people can't get out, cast their ballot. I think electronic allows people more options, but a lot of them still want paper. So I'm, I'm going to be in favor of, of the hybrid option as well. So it's a long electronic and paper from one, two, three, four. So that's, uh, and Carl. Okay, so... I guess the direction that we're going to give staff is that they investigate a electronic and paper option to come together. No one's interested in solely electronic only. Is there anyone interested in electronic only? Anyone interested in paper only? Um, so we're going to ask for electronic and paper and regardless, unknown, unknown, and we do not know what that cost may be. Councillor Charlton. Um, for context, um, I did speak to a uh, councillor in Kings um, and their estimated cost was a dollar per resident. So they have 50,000 residents in Kings. So just for context, um, I'm not anticipating best off, based off that info that that would be extreme, but obviously I don't have all of the facts. That was just a comment made. Um, for, there is a recommendation here, so I guess to CAO Jodry, just want to clarify that um, will we have the ability to act quickly once you receive more information, um, assuming that obviously you could have a special council meeting. I just, I'm just curious, is this coming back at the next council meeting uh, with more info as a discussion and then there's no recommendation because I'd hate to see us miss it on this opportunity with timing. Um, so to the, there were two pieces there. I think that the first one is, um, yes, if essentially you're asking for more information, I would come back with a report that outlines it. You could in that council meeting, um, make that motion or you could refer it as is your current practice to the next meeting. Those choices are up to you. Um, council can make decisions within a council meeting like it doesn't always have to be a recommendation that is your practice but but you don't always have to do that um often because the philosophy is you want sober second thoughts but i mean that's that that ultimately how council makes decision is a council decision um the other just to clarify about sort of what i would intend to bring back and unless it's contrary to Council's thoughts is to explore electronic voting and, and, and different voting methods, what the cost would be, and to present sort of a wholesome report to, to Council. Um, so to, to, to maybe some of the discussion to clarify, so a hybrid, a clear hybrid where there's electronic voting and paper voting gets a bit more complex um, because what happens is you need to make sure that people aren't voting twice. They're not voting on the electronic platform and on the paper, paper platform. So there's, there's reconciliation there where, um, and, and again, I still want to explore this with people who have a lot more experience with this, but one of the suggestions that, that, um, was relayed to me, um, which is probably, it sounds like maybe the way some municipalities are going is they offer electronic voting. Um, in advance, and then on the day of uh, on the day of voting, there are tablets um, where people go into the booth. Instead of marking an X on a paper, you click a tablet. It essentially, is the difference, um, and that actually makes things probably cheaper and faster. But again, it doesn't afford people the opportunity to you know mark on the paper. But it is perhaps a bit more efficient. So I feel like it would be appropriate for staff to bring back a fulsome understanding of what the options are and the implications to that. Um, again, you can make a decision about that right away or forward it on. Um, just being um, 
transparent. We don't have a municipal clerk right now. In fact, we haven't even, uh, we need to start the hiring process, but to do that, uh, my plan is to bring back uh, an updated job description as is the <laughs> current practice to you. Uh, and then we need to hire the hiring process, which will take a while. So I'm, um, uh, I think we need to have an internal discussion about how quickly uh, how we're going to action uh, all of this work and, and who will do it. And we need to figure a lot of that out um, quickly. And so the report that I bring back will try to outline all of that to you. I know these are not exactly the things you want to hear, but this is where we're at right now. Yeah. So your report will be electronic and paper is, is, is what? The majority of council want to know electronic only and also a separate agenda item would have to be clerk and and all those matters are we comfortable with that yes um we should have just a motion that replicates the fact of what we just yeah. reiterated councilor charlton I move that council direct staff to report back on the feasibility and cost of implementing an electronic voting option for the 2024 municipal election in the region of Queens. And you want to add to that electronic and paper? Would you like me to? Just because we discussed not just electronic, but electronic and paper, like a, a hybrid and an electronics, electronic standalone, Electronic and paper. I move that council direct staff to report back on the feasibility and cost of implementing an electronic and paper voting option for the 2024 municipal election in the region of Queens. Thank you. And that's seconded by Councillor Gidney. Any questions on that? All those in favor? Councillor Charlton, you wish to add live streaming as an option. Uh, it's a discussion item, which would basically would be directing staff to come back with information on how that works and perhaps much so. Councillor Charlton. Thank you. Uh, it was just brought to my attention before that it wasn't clear from a staffing point uh, what council's expectations were with live stream. We had talked about it. The consensus had agreed, but there was, there was no clear motion and there's really no clear procedure of what that looks like um, for councillors to understand. So um, just bringing that back up, I think obviously the best approach would be for staff to come back with a report of what that would look like um, with context of what other municipalities do, what how they stream, what they use. Um, you know, just so everyone is aware and then it can be clear to staff that that is what council had wanted originally and we can move that forward. So that is what I'm asking today. So council, um, everyone in favor of live streaming our council meet, meetings and wish to have um, a report based on what platforms, what rules, whether or not people chime in, all those different things that staff would have to investigate. Anyone who does not favor live streaming, speak now, or just, or you want to wait and see what the report looks like. Councilor Brown? I'd like to see uh, what the report comes back with, but I'd be very careful about allowing uh, the public commenting on the live stream because we don't allow public commenting and interaction during our meeting here. So I think we have to try to stay consistent with how we, we have our meetings and how we have our live streaming. Seeing no other comments, I guess everyone's in agreement with that. So Councillor Charlton, do you just want to make a recommendation that staff bring back a report at their earliest convenience? Um, because we have been putting a lot of work on staff that have no clerk. Fair enough. I'm um, respecting that. Uh, I move that staff come back with a report um, on live streaming, live streaming at the earliest convenience. Thank you. And that's seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Thank you. 
And last item on our public agenda, Councillors mm -hmm. Brown and myself and Councillor Hawks have um, all been receiving more information, pictures, respecting the garbage boxes, which are placed for garbage collection on the private roads in LaBelle, even though we have garbage boxes in other parts of Queens. They are our big problem issues. And so, Councillor Brown, if, um, oh, wait, we have one more item, streetlights. Councillor Brown, so either you or Councillor Hawks, do you want to just speak to this matter? Yeah, this has been an ongoing problem for a lot of time, and staff have done a, a have done a great job so far, trying to keep up with it. Uh, but every year around this time, the issue becomes uh, a lot more visible because we we go from three time a week garbage pickup at a lot of these sites to one time a week, and our population has has outgrown the garbage box system. We we've band aided the system together, um, and and done you know. A great job but every year we we're victims of our own success by by having a very popular area that people want to come to we have a lot of people coming with with garbage and um, you know people demand that the region do something about it and I'd just like to say that it's it's not completely a region problem it's it's a people problem I went the other day the, the garbage was piled from the bins all the way out to the road I stepped over the bins over the garbage the bins were empty. There's people that are just too lazy to throw the garbage in the boxes. They're, they're coming along with a half ton truck or a trailer, just unloading it on the side of the, the road in front of the bins. Um, there's a lot of people that are, that are coming in on Fridays and bringing their garbage with them, which is against the bylaws. So there's, you know, there's, there's an educational portion of this, but you know, we, we've tried, we don't have the staff to send uh, bylaw enforcement out every week to try to educate people. When we have sent people out, the problem has gone away because people realize that somebody's watching them. Um, we tried cameras over the years. Uh, I think in one weekend we donated six cameras to, to people who stole them. So, so you know, it's a, th there's a lot of problems, but I think we need staff to have a look at this to come back with a long-term solution that's gonna be a fix for this problem. Because right now, I think last time I talked to uh, our manager of, of solid waste, the 40 gray box sites through Queens County consume half of our budget for garbage collection. So, you know, it, it costs as much as garbage collection for every other resident in the county, which is, is a huge drain. And maybe we can do it better without a huge increase in, in taxes. But these are tax places, these are places that have large tax revenues for us that we don't pl provide a lot of services for and nobody wants to see a mountain of garbage every time they drive into a beautiful pristine wilderness which is what we're seeing on the weekends now um, you know there's there's things that you can't see over we have we have to do something and I, I would like to see a staff report come back with possible solutions for a long-term fix for this thank you councillor brown and i concur that this is our most rapidly growing area of Queens County. Full-time residents, seasonal residents, it brings an extremely large tax revenue to the region of Queens. They're on private roads, no street lights. They have to maintain their own roads. And I, I, I also am of the opinion that we need to have a new look or some really good solutions to to what um, we're going to do about this problem. Councillor Hawks. Yeah, I can echo everything Councillor Brown said. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. I don't know how we're going to fix it, but it needs to be fixed. And it just needs to be fixed. We got to spend the money to do whatever it takes to do it. So would one of you like to make a recommendation that this come back um, as a as a staff report, and we want to fix this this year, so I would say it needs to be back in time um, for budget numbers. I move the staff bring back a, a staff report 
on garbage collection for uh, the private road areas of Queens County. This is not us. Um, I'm going to go off there. Um, just to have the report for a solution that's a long term solution to this problem. Seconded by Councillor Hawks. Any discussion? I, I'd just like to point out that. This is not going to be an easy solution for anybody. I know we've been looking at it for our entire time as, as councillors and council before us has looked at the problem and every solution has has its own set of problems that it creates and I, I don't envy staff trying to come up with with a solution for them but I'm, I'm asking and, and I'm hoping that members of the public will send in recommendations um, to, to any of us councillors that we can forward to staff or, or, or add to this because there's a lot of ideas out there they don't all work but maybe we'll find the, the golden bullet that will that will fix this problem thank you I'll call question on that motion all in favor so we'll look forward Councillor Guinea so we'll look forward staff report on this Councillor Muse streetlights <coughs> I'd like to Angela Green to come over on this topic too. Um, I've got more street lights out in my district and I've been dealing with Angela on this and she can't get anywhere. Um, she's been trying but it just doesn't seem like they want to fix the street lights. Um, I understand there's a lot out in Mersey Point area. I know up Milton I've been seeing them out. In my area it's the lobster season and people are walking to work and driving to work and people are almost getting hit because they haven't fixed the street lights. It's definitely been over 90 days. You know, and they used to, they always had 90 days to fix the street lights. They come and they fix the pole beside the street lights. They take a street light down that somebody stopped paying for, but it doesn't seem like they want to fix them. And I'm just, I don't know what to do. I'm getting calls every week about the street lights out. And we got to do something. I, mean. I do know we pay a substantial bill every month to Nova Scotia Power for those street lights because it comes on a separate bill. Um, and I know Angela, would you just give the review of of what happens when when a councillor or anyone lets you notification of street lights out? So I have the same reporting process as a member of the public does initially. I go through the same channels as anyone else. I get a work order number and the 60 day, 60 business day guarantee. And I keep a spreadsheet of all my burnt out street lights that I have ongoing. And occasionally I drive around at night just to check. <laughs> but um, so, when I hit the 60 days, I then escalate it to our government contact, um, who usually sort of does the gentle pushback with the reminding me of the 60 days, and then we sort of go back and forth. And even in the case of Shore Road um, around Mersey Point there, I uh, got pretty pushy about that because there was sit there's six out. And they gave me a work order and an actual date that the work was supposed to take place. And that didn't happen. So I'm not really sure. Like, as Mayor Norman said, we, we do pay a significant amount of money to Nova Scotia Power to maintain our streetlights. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any sort of rhyme or reason to uh, the order in which they do things or whether they fix things first, second, third, based on sort of a risk level. Cause we did have one out at the Charleston exit at, on the 103. That one was quite dangerous cause we all know that exit is sketchy to start with. Um, and that one took 90 plus days to fix. Um, I know counselor Muse has several out in his district that, like he said, they came and they took one down and fixed a pole and then the next two are out. So I'm not, I, I don't know what to tell you. CEO Jodry wishes to speak. 
Yeah, I think maybe it'd be appropriate, again, to ask for a report. We can come and itemize what we know, what streetlights are out, maybe an action plan. I also have some additional contacts within uh, Nova Scotia Power that may be helpful um, to resolve the issue. So I feel like um, if this is uh, an important issue for council, which it sounds like it probably is, ask us to bring back a report and we can outline um, thoughts and actions that we could take to try to resolve the issue. Yeah, and I think council is going to say it's an important issue. We pay for every street light. If we want a new street light, we know the jigamaro we have to go through. Only our councillor is only allowed to apply for one new street light in their district to keep the costs down. But yet we are paying for a tremendous amount of street lights, which are burnout. And it doesn't matter if they're burnout; we're still paying Nova Scotia Power for them. So I think we need to either not pay the Nova Scotia power bill for the burnout lights, or we need that staff report. Okay. Councillor Muse? So I got a hold of somebody last week for the Nova Scotia power, and I told them that it seems like it's the problem has got bigger since we had the LED lights in, and, and the guy told me, well, there's no way because the LED lights never burn out. Well, I'm going to tell them, I told him, well, you better go for a drive and check the poles because they're burnt out. And or they're not coming on or something. And he goes, well, it's the sensors on the top. And he said, they got to be changed. And I said, well, I don't think I got a ladder high enough to go up and change them sensors. So he said, yes. He said, he said, are you sure you, you reported the lights? Yes, the lights have been reported. And then he goes, well, I'll I'll check into it and get back to you. And I haven't heard anything. So I believe we need a staff report on those lights. And we also, it would be really interesting if we even had an estimate of how many street lights are burnt out because they're burnt out all over Queens County. And, you know, the simple calculation of figuring out what we pay for each light and how much we're not going to pay for the burnout lights. Uh, was there another comment? Councillor Brown? I'd just like to comment that I think in our last budget we... We budgeted about eighty thousand dollars for the end of life uh, cost of the sodium vapor lights that they changed for these LED lights. So, you know, they they weren't they weren't end of life, and we paid to have them replaced, and now we're paying for lights that aren't working. So I think um, unless <coughs> Councillor Muse wants to make the motion, I, I can make it. Councillor Muse. I move that we uh, have a staff report come back uh, listing uh, with a. Uh, a recommendation on how to fix the number of burnt out lights and what we can do going forward, maybe make a list of, of what which ones are, are burnt out. 